Heather was our executive director for how many years? Eight years. And she has garnered so much information here. <laughs> and it's no wonder that she loves being the sponsor of the History Day. When she was actually born in Las Cruces and then her family moved to Gallup and then spent the bulk of her career here in Los Alamos. She has a bachelor's degree in journalism and political science from Drake University and has a master's in history from the University of South Florida. After retiring as the executive director at the Los Alamos Historical Society, she and her husband have been traveling the world looking for warm places to live. Then they got stuck in Panama when the pandemic hit. But they have now settled in Los Cruces, and she serves as a statewide coordinator for the National History Day, an academic competition for students in grades 6 through 12. She has a history and museum consulting business, and she spends an important amount of time and money on bird watching. <laughs> she loves living next door to the source of the world's best green chili. She is also continuing to work on her rough draft of a book about Los Alamos and the history that Bathtub Row Press will pu publish in the future. So ladies and gentlemen, well, I would like to present the one, the only, Ed McClanahan. Thank you. Ah, here we go. Thank you for being here. It is really wonderful to be back in this building, which is my favorite building on the planet. I've visited many. Um, Familia Sagrada in Spain is close, but uh, it's always great to be in Fuller Lodge, and it's fabulous to be able to speak about some really amazing women. When Todd and Sherry asked me to give this talk, I, I struggled a little bit. So I want to start with what this talk is not. This talk is not comprehensive. There are many women from the ranch school, like Mae Connell, who will not be addressed, women from the Manhattan Project that you've probably heard of that I will not be talking about tonight. <coughs> it is not modern, with the exception of the person that I talk about at the end, which will make more sense when we get there. It is a historic talk. And I am not going to be presenting comprehensive biographies. Do you all know how many women have lived on this street? <laughs> There's a lot, and they're super interesting. And so these are really going to be, what this talk is, is snapshots of the lives of some of the women who lived on the street, mostly about their time on the street. It's stories and anecdotes, and occasionally it is interactive. So I'm going to need some input from you all during the talk. So as I said, when Todd and Sherry asked me to do this, I, I struggled. How do you tell the stories of the women of Bathtub Row. How comprehensive? Do we do every woman? No, we're not doing that. We know that already. So then do I want to do it linearly by house? Do we start with the guest cottage and the baker house and make our way up the street? That didn't work for me. Do we do it by the most famous, Kitty Oppenheimer? Everybody knows her name and then come on down to Peggy Pond Church. No, that didn't work for me either. When I think of Los Alamos history, I think of it in very neat and tight chronological eras. We have our ancestral Pueblo era. We have our homestead era. They're, and especially once you get to homesteading and the ranch school and the Manhattan Project, those are very specific dates. And that is how I think of Los Alamos history. So for the most part, that is what we are doing. We are going to do this chronologically with one exception. Now, I am sure that pretty much everybody in this room knows this, but just to make sure that we are all on the same page, we're going to do a little quick Los Alamos history lesson. The Los Alamos Ranch School started in 1917. The buildings that we are talking about tonight on the street that is known as Bathtub Row were constructed during that period. During the Manhattan Project, it is where the upper level military and scientific people lived. That's where it got its name of Bathtub Row because these were the only homes in town with bathtubs. The story that is told is that bathtubs in these days are made of iron. 
Iron is needed for the war effort. Army is slapping up buildings as quickly as they can, well, Army and their subcontractors, as quickly as they can. Apartment buildings with showers. So with the exception of the WAC dorm, there weren't bathtubs in Los Alamos. And yet Oppenheimer and uh, um, Parsons are living in these houses with bathtubs. And so Bathtub Row becomes the name. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in just a second. We have the Atomic Energy Commission era to the, through the Cold War where we started the private ownership of these buildings and I would say very thankfully preservation of these buildings uh, during that time and of course up to today. I don't know how many of you know this story, but when the Atomic Energy Commission laid out the map of Los Alamos, this street over here was called 20th Street and that's what the sign said. Well in 2007, Larry Campbell, the president of the Historical Society at the time said, that's dumb. So he went to Los Alamos County government and he said, everybody calls this bathtub row. This is bathtub row. Let's rename it bathtub row. And so the street signs that you see today, and it is, according to Google Maps, the only bathtub row in the United States. <laughs> Alice Kimball Smith did not live on bathtub row, but she did name it. And so I thought we should talk a little bit about her tonight. Um, in Laura Fermi's book, Adams and the Family, she says that it was a, and I quote directly, a stroke of wit where Alice Kimball Smith named Bathtub Row. Alice herself is an extraordinary woman, as all of the women we are going to be talking about tonight are. She has her PhD in political science from Yale. She taught history at Los Alamos High School because, you know, Los Alamos, right? <laughs> Uh, she, uh, after the war, went to Chicago with her husband. She became the editor, assistant editor of the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists. She is co-author of, or co-editor, I should say, of this book on um, the letters and recollections of Robert Oppenheimer. She also wrote a book about the movement of the scientists who started um, the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists and the science movement in America. To this day, and in fact quite active, Yale University has what they call the Kimball Smith series. Did any of y'all know about this? I thought this was so cool. It's a series of panels, lectures, discussions. It's not really weekly, but it's more than monthly, so it's going on all the time at Yale University where cross-disciplinary people get together and they talk about science, technology, global affairs, and ethics which is what Alice Kimball Smith was all about. So I just thought that was super, super cool. And uh, I love her squash blossom in this photo too. All right, on to the women of Bathtub Row. The very first person we're going to talk about is Genevieve Ranger. Genevieve lived in the guest cottage, which we now know as the Los Alamos History Museum. Interesting thing about this building, we, Craig and I, in uh, our book, which we failed to mention in the introduction, many, many years ago now, Craig and I wrote this book called Of Logs and Stone, The Buildings of the Los Alamos Ranch School and Bathtub Row. And we talk about the, the guest cottage, or, which was the infirmary for the ranch school, originally being built in 1917 as part of the ranch school. We found some pictures of Harold Brooks' homestead, which predate the ranch school, and that building's in it. So it's really older than 1917 oldest continuously used building in Los Alamos, and this is Genevieve Ranger sitting on the front porch. She was the nurse and the matron at the ranch school from 1918 to 24, and then she returned as the matron in 28 to 29. She had a real bad problem. Anybody else have this real bad problem in Los Alamos? Allergies. Yeah, yeah. okay, we can all relate, right? <laughs> so that's why she had to leave in 1924. Uh, but Worth and Aldrich in their book, uh, the Los Alamos, the ranch school years, say that she was very level-headed, she never lost her temper. Even more importantly, she was a woman of grit and substance who could hold her own against A.J. Connell. I want to read to you a little bit from When Los Alamos Was a Ranch School, that is this book by Peggy Pond and Farmer Church. And I'm sure you will see Peggy's writing in this description. As matron, Ranger's job was to oversee the general housekeeping, which meant coping with temperamental cooks and elusive Indian or Spanish-American houseboys, as well as planning menus both wholesome and abundant. 
The diet was the mainspring of the health building program of the school, and the school's director had gourmet tastes. Rather often, Ranger would have to take her own hand at cooking on the huge blacktop wood-burning range when a cook failed to return from a weekend spree in town. Fortunately, she was something of a gourmet cook herself. One of the faculty wives, and I suspect strongly this is Peggy speaking here, still cherishes her recipes for orange marmalade and for minestrone cone pasta made of vegetables from the school's own garden. In spring and fall, Ranger would keep black, potter, black pottery bowls, probably Maria Martinez bowls, filled with local wildflowers. It was always Miss Ranger who discovered the first pask flowers among the pine needles at the edge of the snow in March or April. In June, she would go on horseback to gather golden pea or Indian paintbrush. In the summer, there were gladioli from the school's gardens, and in autumn, tremendous dahlias for which Adolfo Montoya, the head gardener, always took prizes at the county fair. Ranger had a warm-hearted but no-nonsense attitude toward the boys, tending their occasional sniffles or upset stomachs, consulting by telephone when a physician was needed. And so that is Genevieve Ranger. Our next incredible woman is Peggy Pond Church. Peggy lived down at the end of Bathtub Row in what is often called the church house. It's on the other side of Peach Street, Master Cottage number three. And as Sharon points out to me often, Peggy did not live on Bathtub Row. It didn't get the name until after Peggy was gone, but she's still a woman that we are going to talk about tonight because she did live in these houses. Peggy was the daughter of the ranch school founder, Ashley Pond. She married from her church, who was a master, and we tease often, but it's not too far from the truth that she married him so that she could live back up here because she loved the Pajarito Plateau. And she had three boys, two of whom attended the ranch school. She is the poet and, of course, the author of the incredible book, The Woman at Ottawa Bridge, that is still in print after, what, almost 70 years now, I think. House, House at Ottawa Bridge, thank you. Don't want to get that mixed up with the Frank Waters book, sorry. So, I'm going to read some of, um, Sharon Snyder is the biographer of Peggy Pond Church. If you haven't read it, this is an award-winning, fabulous, wonderful book. Please read it. Sharon will sign your copy when you buy it. Um, and I'm going to read just a little piece from this about Peggy's experience in her house, or at her house. It was just as well that a log house in the wilderness presented a good many special problems that helped keep my feet on the ground and my wits from wandering too much of the time among the stars, Peggy said of her first decade as a ranch school wife. Her home was the farthest north on the row of log and stone structures that housed some of the masters and staff. Only a stand of young pines stood between the church home and Pueblo Canyon to the north. Because of the location, Peggy and Firm sometimes felt that they had the mountains and mesas to themselves. I don't know whether it was my good fortune or bad, Peggy said, to have been so enchanted with the great dramas of cloud and light that we looked down on every season from our windows. Perhaps they made me too often dissatisfied with the routine of daily life and with the mere mortals that I lived among and that I rather hated to admit I was. And so that is Peggy Pond Church, wonderful poet and writer, and if you haven't read her stuff, you, you should. All right, this is an interactive part. Yes, does anyone know the name of the wife of Sir James Chadwick? the man who won the Pulitzer Prize for the discover of the neutron. Anybody know? <laughs> I didn't either. Her name is Eileen Chadwick. And there's actually a really wonderful biography of James Chadwick called The Neutron and the Bomb by a man named Andrew Brown. And James came from a very working class background and life suddenly changed for James one night when he was introduced to a vivacious, self-assured young lady who was staying with friends, in his, in, friends of his in Cambridge. Her name was Eileen Stewart Brown, and by whatever law of attraction of opposites works, 
she had a devastating effect on the dry, reserved Dr. Chadwick. A friend writing to his mother in June of 1925 remarked, Chadwick is up to his ears in love and the crocodile, that is Ernest Rutherford, growls that he's not working enough. The daughter of a Liverpool stockbroker, the vivacious now Mrs. Chadwick and James married in August of 1925 with rumors spreading around Liverpool that Eileen was marrying some mad scientist who spent all of his time in the laboratory. Um, Sir James biggest, uh, Brown, the, the biographer, claims that Sir James was, or I'm sorry, that Eileen was Sir James's biggest supporter and that she would shrink from no skirmish on his behalf. Joseph Rotblatt was quite close with the Chadwicks. He was, of course, a Manhattan Project scientist who went on to uh, win a Nobel Peace Prize because of his work in the um, Pugwash Conference. But he was quite close with them, and he said, you know, Eileen was really a warm person, and she had a keen sense of humor once you got past her class bias. She grew up in upper middle class Liverpool. Upper middle class in England is very different than upper middle class in the United States. And she was very aware of her class. So the Chadwicks moved into the Baker house, um, the chief mechanic's house, the white striped building right over here, um, early in 1944. Uh, this was right after, uh, they, were, they came as part of the British, British mission, and this was right after he had received his um, knight, knighthood, uh, which was, he, they found out about that on January 1st of 1944. Los Alamos was a fairly egalitarian community, as you all know. Eileen was not. Eileen had a tea party one time, and she had an American grandfather, but she was talking about the backwardness of America, and she was living in this log cabin, and it just really did not go over well. She did not get along well with people in Los Alamos. But there is this wonderful story in the biography, and I think it was with Rotblatt. They were out hiking, and they were down in Pueblo Canyon, and they came up, and to get back into Los Alamos, they were going to have to go all the way around to the gate, and Rotblatt's looking around, and he goes, why don't we just climb under the fence? And she did. So. Even Lady Chadwick would do that. Um, so let me just read this last, um, last part. Uh, here we go. James was absent from Los Alamos at least as much as he was here, traveling between Montreal, Washington, and other Manhattan Project sites. So on January 1st, he was knighted. Um, Eileen was now in her element as Lady Chadwick and decided that since her husband seemed to be an indispensable part of what was happening in Washington, D.C., that there was really no point for her and their twin 17-year-old daughters to stay here in Los Alamos anymore. She left the hill with no regrets. In April, the family found a house to rent near DuPont Circle in Washington, D.C. Now, this is interesting, because all of these women I'm talking about, we have so many stories and so much to talk about. And so I said, oh, I want to do Lois Bradbury. Everybody knows Lois Bradbury. She was the first lady of Los Alamos for 25 years. The Los Alamos Historical Society does not have an oral history of Lois Bradbury. I don't know that we have anything written by Lois Bradbury. What I know about Lois Bradbury as a historian of Los Alamos history is conversations I've had with people where they either said she was my music teacher and she was a really nice lady. Or when we moved to town, my parents had dinner there because all new hires came to their house for dinner when Bradbury was the director of the laboratory. So Lois and Norris lived on the north side of what we now, or what we've called always the Arts and Crafts Building where the O'Donnells live. And they were next door neighbors with the next lady we'll be talking about, the McMillans, as I say. Her husband was the second director of the laboratory. But we just don't have a lot of stories and very few pictures. There's a, there's a book about Norris Bradbury that is all about Norris Bradbury. It doesn't mention Lois. So if we have some time at the end, I would like to go ahead and maybe uh, see if we can share some stories that will get report, recorded on Pack 8 this evening about Lois Bradbury. This is Elsie McMillan. And it's kind of like saying you have a favorite kid, but I do. Whoops. Sorry, Peggy. <laughs> so this is Elsie's memoir. It's called The Adam and Eve. 
and it's, uh, it's actually quite, quite fun to read. She talks about a lot of the travels they did uh, while they were living here and, uh, and things like this. So I want to start, uh, well, let me start with the, what I, I hate to say this, and, and I'm going to have to ask for forgiveness, but there were a large number of women who lived in Los Alamos during the Manhattan Project who had women from the Pueblos who took care of their house. They took care of their husbands and ran their households and had babies and were homemakers and moms, and that's what they did in Los Alamos. And so there is this sort of typical Los Alamos housewife, and, and Elsie falls into this category, um, except for the fact that she got to live on bathtub row. And she says in her memoir the reason they got to live on bathtub row is because they were actually one of the first families to, to get here. So Elsie, Elsie's husband is um, Edwin McMillan. He would win the 1952 Nobel Prize in Chemistry. He was a physicist, but he won a Nobel Prize in Chemistry for the discovery with Glenn Seaborg of transuranic uh, elements. But that was after they lived here. But because of his physics work and because they got here very early, they got to live next door to the Oppenheimers in Master Cottage Number 1, or what we call now the Hans Bethe House. And so, in her memoir, Elsie writes, after a trip to the commissary with baby Anne in tow, on my return home, I was greeted at the back door by a young army officer. Many of you have probably heard this story. Grinning all over, he said, Mrs. Oppenheimer, your baby is just fine. She didn't cry at all while you were gone. <laughs> Thank you, I said, but I'm not Mrs. Oppenheimer, nor did I leave a baby in the house, since her baby was right there with her. Mrs. Oppenheimer lives next door. Good Lord, he replied, I'm guarding the wrong house, at which he ran like a bat out of hell for the Oppenheimers to check and see if Tony was all right. Now, I love this story. However, as a historian who has been called a stickler by a major television actor, the man who played Frank Winter on the Manhattan series, I do find a problem with it. Elsie writes that this happened early in 1944, as soon as they, or sorry, 1943, as soon as they moved into the Beta House. Uh, Tony Oppenheimer wasn't born until December of 1944. So we know with memoirs and oral histories that memories aren't always accurate. Sometimes things run together. And I'm going to go with that story really happened. She just got the date wrong because it's too good of a story to let go. But more poignant, and I think more significant historically, is Elsie's telling of her experience surrounding the Trinity test. Another interactive question here. Anybody know who Elsie McMillan's brother-in-law is? Oh, you guys are going to get a kick out of this. Anybody know? Anybody ever heard of the man who invented the cyclotron, Ernest Lawrence? Her sister was married to Ernest Lawrence. Well, I mean, yeah, can you imagine being the parents and saying, yes, my daughter's husband won the Nobel Prize. Yeah, my other daughter's husband won the Nobel Prize. But they were not unconnected people. Their father, um, Elsie and her sister, their father was the um, head of the Yale Medical School. So, you know, there, there's some connections there. But uh, let me share with you from Elsie's memoir, uh, Trinity, and, uh, and what happened. So just before the Trinity test, Ed and Elsie were talking about it, and uh, she wrote this of their conversation. We ourselves are not absolutely certain of what will happen, Ed said. In, despite of in spite of calculations, we are going into the unknown. We know that there are three possibilities. One, that we will be blown to bits if it is more powerful than we expect. If this happens, you and the world will immediately be told. Two, it may be a complete dud. If this happens when I return home, I'll tell you. Third, it, it may be, as we hope, a success and we pray without any loss of lives. So she goes on to write about this scene a few weeks later. Late one afternoon, Niels Bohr, my brother-in-law, Ernest Lawrence, General Groves, and Bill Lawrence, the only member of the press allowed to attend, arrived at Los Alamos. Ernest came home with Ed for dinner that night. Thank God my sister did not know where he was or why he had come. It was no surprise to me when he left early. Ed and I also retired with our alarm set set for 2.30 a.m. Ed would leave at 3.15. We did not want to allow much time. I would cook him a hearty breakfast and hope he could eat it. We did not want to say 
goodbye. He had gone now. I was so cold. I was so scared. It seemed so long to wait all that day until the early hours of the next before we would have any hope of news. I had to try and get some more sleep. I had to feed the children when they awoke. I had to walk that mesa and appear my usual vivacious self for all of the coming hours, for many did not know and must not suspect. I prayed in that early morning light and repeated the Lord's Prayer, especially the phrase, Thy will be done. Somehow, the day passed, and the children were tucked in for the night. There was a light tap on my door. There stood Lois Bradbury, my friend and neighbor. She knew. Her husband was out there, too. She said her children were asleep and would be all right since she was so close, and she could check on them every so often to make sure. Please, let us stay together this long night, she said. We talked of many things, of our men whom we love so much, of the children, their futures, of the war and all of its horrors. We kept the radio on softly, despite the fact that our last word had been that the test would probably be at 5 a.m. We dared not turn it off. <coughs> she goes on. Lois and I must have consumed gallons of coffee that night. Shortly before 5 o'clock, we turned up the radio and went to the back windows to silently watch the sky. You can stand at that window in the Beta House now. Nothing but blackness confronted us. It was 5.15, and we began to wonder. Had weather conditions been wrong? Had it been a dud? I sat at the window, feeding Ed's and my baby. Lois stood staring out. There was such quiet in that room. Suddenly, there was a flash of light, and the whole sky lit up. It was 5.32 a.m. The baby didn't notice. We were too fearful and awed to speak. When Ed returned that night, she met him at the door with tears streaming down her face. Martha Parsons lived in Peggy Pond Church's house. Master Cottage number three. I found this little article about Martha on the internet, and I just wanted to share it with you because I just think it is the cutest thing. This is her when she was probably in her early to early 20s, and the headline says, Favors the Navy. Miss Martha Colverius, daughter of Rear Admiral Colverius of Norfolk, Virginia, and granddaughter of Admiral William T. Sampson of Spanish War fame, couldn't get away from the Navy. She will marry Lieutenant W.S. Parsons of Fort Sumner, New Mexico. And that is, of course, who we all know as Deke Parsons, the assistant director of the laboratory during the Manhattan Project, who ran all of the ordnance and armed the Enola Gay for use on Japan. There's a really wonderful oral history interview of Deke and Martha's daughter, Peggy Bowditch on the Voices of the Manhattan Project website, which has many, many wonderful stories and oral histories. And, and Peggy described her mom as somebody who was very much a doer, somebody who just got things done. They had the biggest house on Bathtub Rose, we're gonna hear in just a minute, and, and there were times when Kitty couldn't, for whatever reason, host a party, didn't wanna host a party, and Martha would host those larger parties because their house was actually bigger. But she did go out, you know, riding. She loved to ride horses. She loved to play tennis and, and do a lot of those sorts of things. So, so from this interview with uh, Peggy Bowditch, their older daughter, she said, we had a very nice house. I think it was probably the biggest house on Bathtub Row. Los Alamos had been a boys' school, and there was Fuller Lodge in the center, and then I cannot remember the number of houses on Bathtub Row. We were down at the end, and we had the distinction, I don't know how many of you know this, this was news to me, we had the distinction of having two bathtubs. That got us into a bit of trouble once. Because there were only showers in all the Los Alamos construction, and there was a soldier being released from the hospital, but the nurse told him he would need to take baths, not showers. And he said, well, where? And the nurse said, oh, Mrs. Parsons won't mind. <laughs> the trouble is, she did not tell my mother. And mother arrived home to find this poor soldier in the bathtub, which I'm sure embarrassed him more than it embarrassed her. She says, and we lived next door to the Oppenheimers, and at times, I guess these were times of great security, we would have somebody patrolling our house, or the Oppenheimers' house, or two walking around together. But that was kind of hit or miss, and I'm sure it was dependent on something that was going on. 
And so then we have the story about Martha not being able to get into her own house. She was going out on a social call just down the street, left her purse at home, you know, just running out for a few minutes, goes back to her house, and there's a guard, and he will not let her into the house. It's like, but I'm Mrs. Parsons. I live here. You just saw me leave. <laughs> He's, Mrs. Parsons, I need to see your pass before I can let you into your house. So they actually had to find Deke and get him to come. You know, he was uh, thankfully was not out of town for once and was at the technical area. And and of course, you know, she couldn't use her own phone in her house because she, she couldn't get in to get call him. And so anyway, it was this whole series comedy of errors um, that the guard would not let Mrs. Uh, Parsons into her own home, but she did finally make it. You may find this surprising. Kitty Oppenheimer lived in the Oppenheimer house. <sighs> so I struggle with Kitty, and um, I've been doing, uh, I've been working with the Historical Society on some, some stuff with the Oppenheimer house recently, and I've been doing a lot of research. And uh, Sherry and I have talked about this and, and battled a little bit. And, and Sherry thinks we need to give Kitty a bit of a break. As a, as a military wife, Sherry understands. And I say, Kitty wasn't a military wife. She was a civilian wife, which should have been even more. And so, so I'm going to probably come down pretty hard on Kitty. And I apologize for Kitty fans, but I don't think she was a very nice person. But I do think she was very devoted to her husband. Kitty wanted Oppie to get the job. And he wanted the job. He talked about how he pursued General Groves as a, um, uh, you know, like a lover in order to get the directorship of the laboratory here. So then Kitty is the first lady of Los Alamos. Her husband's the director. Well, she's coming out of Berkeley, where if you're the director of the physics department, if you're a dean, if you're the president of the university, there's certain expectations with that, right? So she thinks, I'm going to be married to the director of this big military project. She came to Los Alamos, <laughs> which had dirt roads and no good water and no good electricity. And so the idea was much less glamorous than the expectation. But more so, Kitty was totally devoted to Robert. And she didn't get to see him. Everybody else got to see Robert Oppenheimer more than Kitty Oppenheimer did. The lab demanded him. The community demanded him. The military demanded him. And so everybody else got him more than she did. And that was very hard on her. But her husband's career was very important. Many of you probably know the story that Oppie was Kitty's fourth husband. Her second husband had been a communist organizer in Pennsylvania. And she kind of followed him around doing menial work. She was a very bright woman. She wanted to work on her PhD in botany. In fact, that's what she was trying to do when she met Oppenheimer in California. Quickly divorced her third husband so she could marry Oppie. But she was living with, or she was married to Joe uh, and, and following him around, trying to help him with all of his communist stuff. And he goes off and gets himself killed in the Spanish Civil War. And, and her biographers, there's this really, really wonderful book. You can see, I'm doing research in this book, right? <laughs> A really wonderful book called Atomic Love Story. And the uh, authors talk about how she was once again, just like she had been with Joe, living with a man who was the center of her universe, only to find that she was not the center of his. She also reportedly, and this is reported by people who consider themselves friends of hers, like um, Dorothy McKibben, the gatekeeper of Los Alamos, that she did not get along well with other women. And that, but she did have a group of women here that she would ride horses with and drink in the afternoons, but no close friends. So, so from this book that I just showed you, Atomic Love Story, in the summer of 1944, Kitty was bored, tired, and five months pregnant. She had a sense of superiority that made people nervous, and she had no enthusiasm for women's clubs or teas or community building efforts. And you know, if you, when you read Eleanor Jetty's book and you look at Elsie McMillan's book and you, you see what these women were doing, they were trying to build community where none was. And so we have the development of the little theater and we have 
concerts that go on and, and you know just all of these things that happen in Los Alamos and Kitty didn't want to be a part of that. Emily Morrison, the wife of, wife of one of Robert's protégés, explained Kitty was a very strange woman. She would pick a pet, one of the wives, and be extraordinarily friendly with her and then drop her for no reason. She had temporary favorites. That's the way she was. She did it to one person after another. She could be a very bewitching person, but she was someone to be wary of. One of the women Kitty turned her attention to for a time was Shirley Barnett, the young wife of the project's pediatrician. Kitty would ask Shirley to lunch and shopping trips to Santa Fe, and she, Shirley remembers Kitty always had a bottle of something with her when she was driving, and you could always tell when she was getting drunk because she would talk more freely. She was fascinating, but not very nice. She was not very happy, and you get the sense that she never really had been. And so when you think subsequently, Kitty and Robert go to Princeton. He heads up the, um, my brain isn't there, um, the Institute for Advanced Studies at Princeton. And so she does get to be that director's wife. She gets to live in that big, beautiful house. But she still struggled with alcohol, and she still struggled with depression and, and probably various types of mental illness. So um, there's a lot of deepness here and, and a lot of unhappiness to Kitty. But the woman who lived in the house after her has quite a wicked sense of humor. Like Elsie, I would say that Eleanor Jetty is sort of a typical Manhattan Project wife and mother. She was also a big horseback rider. And, and it was interesting, as I was doing my research, I was just you know, looking at some different reviews of Eleanor's book on Amazon and on Goodreads. She may be one of the more famous people to have come out of Los Alamos, and we don't even realize that, but lots of people read her book, and they have a lot to say about it online. So that was kind of interesting. She, of course, is the author of uh, one of the first publications that the Los Alamos Historical Society did, and that is this fabulous book, Inside Box 1663. It's really, I think, the quintessential insider's look. Because her husband, Eric Jetty, was fairly high up in the laboratory. She knew everybody. It was a small town. But she, she also made a point to kind of know people and do things and, and be active. And so she wrote this great book. And her story about her bathtub is classic Manhattan Project lore. They moved in in December of 1945. The Oppenheimers had moved out in the fall of 45. And she tells this story. Our bathtub was an antique with tiger feet, but it looked good to me. I hadn't had a good soak since my visit to Denver the previous January, so almost a year. I'm going to fill the tub and relax, I told Eric. I'm looking forward to a good soak too, but you take your time, he said. I turned on the taps and adjusted the temperature before undressing. I kicked off my shoes and I was about to shimmy out of my blue jeans when there was a knock at the front door. I heard the rumble of masculine voices and swore under my breath. It was almost 10 o'clock, a fine hour for someone to come calling. I padded out in my bare feet to see who was there. Eric and Joe Burke, who was in charge at DP, stood in the middle of the living room and just looked at each other. Eric's face was grim, and Joe's was marked with deep lines of fatigue. What on earth is the matter, I said. We shut down at DP, Joe said. But why? No water. No water? But I've got the water running in the tub right now. You're lucky you had the water running. You're draining your line right into the tub. Oh, I better turn off the hot water right now, or I'll drain the boiler, and we'll blow up. It was about six months before water service was fully restored to Los Alamos. This was the time uh, Rose Beta, who moved into the Hans Beta house after the McMillans moved out, tells a story about when the pipes froze in that December, and she and her kids just went back to Ithaca, and poor um, Hans was, was here on his own. So um, it, was, uh, it was quite a, a six-month period. But uh, if you haven't read Eleanor's book, I can't recommend it enough. It's just a, a great, great story. Now, this is where we're doing a little bit of an exception, where I am talking about a house instead of um, a specific woman who lived in the house. The list, I think, according to the historical record that I've been able to track down, is every woman who has lived 
in Spruce Cottage. Now, Spruce Cottage was originally built for the Spruce Patrol, the big boys at the ranch school. They didn't have to live in the big house, the dormitory, with the rest of the boys. Cecil Worth, one of the masters, lived there with the boys, and then he went off and got married, which really made A.J. mad um, for a lot of reasons, but one of those was A.J. had to build on to the Spruce Cottage and expand it so that Virginia could be a little bit separated from the boys. So Virginia Worth lived there, and then Betty Whalen, who was also the wife of one of the masters. The masters in the 40, 40, 41, 42, they started what we call, what Craig and I call musical chairs or musical houses uh, with the houses. Depending on the number of people who were living there, and like when, when Peggy and Firmer Church's sons started coming to the ranch school, they moved out of their house because it was bigger, and somebody with a bigger family moved in. So there's all this moving around. So then we have Virginia Worth, Betty Whalen, Peggy Church was the last ranch school woman to live in the house. And then we have the Whack Shack. The Women's Army Corps came to Los Alamos. This had already been a dormitory, right? And so the first thing that, they, the, first thing that the Army did was they put Women's Army Corps members into this dormitory, and it got that nickname, the Whack Shack. I'm leaving that there. We're not going to talk any more about that, other than to say they moved out when some more dormitories were built to the north. There's all kinds of rumors. Peg Bainbridge, the wife of Ken Bainbridge, who was in charge of the Trinity test, lived in the house. A wonderful story from her daughters about she held a big party when I.I. Robbie, Isidore Robbie, won the 1944 Nobel Prize, and they had a roulette wheel, and they played roulette for turns in the bathtub. <laughs> um, Eleanor Ramsey, wife of Norman, Francoise Ulam, wife of Stan, who was of course uh, the <coughs> instrumental mathematician in the super. Kay Manley, wife of John Manley, and of course longtime members of our community that I'm sure some of you have stories of. Uh, and uh, they lived in the house for a while. Now, Laura Fermi, I have on this list because this is, this is a funny story too. Laura and Enrico Rome apartment dwellers. So when they first came to Los Alamos during the Manhattan Project, they were offered a bathtub room cottage, and they were like, no, I don't think we want to live in a log cabin with an Italian accent. And um, I think they regretted that decision, because when they came back in the 1950s, um, in the early 1950s during the summers when Enrico was working at the lab, uh, they did live in Spruce Cottage. Betty Lilienthal, who was a um, wonderful photographer and did a lot of work with Dorothy Horde on the petroglyphs down in White Rock Canyon, and our current resident, Colleen Bollinger, who is a wonderful preservationist. That's Spruce Cottage. Okay, we're getting close to the end here. Mary Martin. Any of you all ever heard of Mary Martin? Probably not. But you all do know that the building that we are in right now was a hotel in the 1950s and 60s. The hotel had a manager, and the manager lived in what we now call the guest cottage, the uh, museum. And so I got to interview Mary Martin. She was still alive when Craig and I were working on her book, uh, our book. And, <laughs> and she tells this story. I don't have any pictures of her, unfortunately. She said, um, Mary Martin was charmed by the, by the cottage. She felt at home in its simple comfort. The furnishings included hand-carved trunks about the size of cedar chests and rustic bedroom furniture made of latias lashed together with thongs. Mary believed some of the furnishings were made by the boys at the ranch school working in the wood shop at the Arts and Crafts building. As an additional attraction, she loved being close to the adjacent Memorial Rose Garden. Yet, living in an old log cabin is not always charming and quaint. One night, Martin and her husband woke up to an overwhelming smell of skunk. It appeared that a group of skunks had been hanging out under the cottage, staying warm near the steam pipes that brought heat into the house. One of the pipes leaked onto the skunks, and they let their displeasure be known. The Martins had to move out of the house for about a month while it and everything in it were deodorized. And Helene Sudan. A longtime community volunteer, worked at the museum for years and years, worked in many other organizations around our community, and a storyteller. And I think John can relate to this. Helene and Jerry moved into the house in the 1950s when it was still owned by the Atomic Energy Commission. And 
as you all know, there was a very complex point system for housing in Los Alamos at that time. This was based on the size of your family, the amount of time you'd been at the laboratory, the job you had at the laboratory, your salary. There were all these variables that went into it. And Helene, John and I have probably heard this story a dozen times from Helene. And she tells it differently. She told it two different ways. One is that the lady in the housing office was looking and, and Jerry and Helene Sudam tied with another couple with the exact same amount of points. And that the lady looked at it and said, well, the Sudams have been here a little longer, so I'm going to give them an extra point, and they got the house. Another time, or many times, she said, well, the lady in the housing office just liked Jerry better, so she gave him the house. <laughs> Regardless, the uh, Sudams in 2003 signed a life trust agreement to donate the house to the Los Alamos Historical Society with the stipulation that they got to live in it as long as they were alive. And Helene, bless her heart, lived to be 100 years old. Uh, this is at Helene's 95th birthday. That is John Romaner presenting her with one of the uh, maquettes of the uh, Oppenheimer statue out here. And uh, I love this picture of her because it's how I always think of her sitting in her living room and telling us a story. And so she was just a, a, a very fun person to be around. She loved to have her afternoon glass of sherry, wanted people to join her in those things. And, uh, and it was just, just a great, great person. So what I want you to think about then, and maybe even close your eyes to do this, is use all of your senses and consider the stories of these women. The reason I showed the slide is because I want you to think about Genevieve Ranger's flowers in color, not in the black and white photos you see from the ranch school. I want you to think about Peggy Pond Church talking about clouds and light and mesas and mountains while she's trying to corral three young boys. I want you to think about Eileen Chadwick. Oh, and I need to apologize um, to the 15 years worth of tours that I led when I said that Eileen Chadwick was a London debutante. She was a Liverpool debutante. That makes a difference to some people. But, but here is a woman who was a, a very high society person in Great Britain. And then Martha Parsons, who in American military society, a very high person. And the kind of privations that they endured when they came to Los Alamos. I want you to think about the fears that Elsie McMillan conveyed during the Trinity test. She was cold and scared. Kitty Oppenheimer's unmet expectations. And maybe what it could have been had she been different, had circumstances been different. Think about Mary Martin and the skunks. And then Helene Sudan and her absolute generosity to give the community such a treasure as the Oppenheimer House. As a historian, I am always looking for connections. So I wanted to know, as I was researching these women, what other than a street do they have in common? With the exception of Genevieve Ranger, everybody that I talked about tonight was the wife of. And that bugs me. <laughs> but I can't change it. It is what it is, right? So. What I wanted to do was reach beyond that. And I wanted to say these women each have their own identities, their own personalities, their own contributions. And they do. So if you think about each of them, they were all educated. They were all brilliant, but that is often overshadowed by the brilliance of their Nobel Prize winning husbands. They all made incredible contributions to their family, to their community, and to their society. They were resilient, they had to fight against a lot, they were tenacious and curious, and they had perseverance. Every single one of these women had these characteristics. And generosity, even Kitty, with her friends that she would pick, would be generous. So again, to go back, we're not just thinking of them as names and, and as flat pictures, but as real women who stood or sat in this very room and had experiences here, just like we're having experiences. Real people 
that we don't want to lose. And honestly, it's extraordinary to have this collection. This is a small bit of my research. Their memoirs, their biographies, absolutely amazing. And, and this was really brought home to me. A couple of weeks ago, I was at the Historical Society of New Mexico conference in Silver City. And the keynote speaker was a professor from UNM who is doing research on Tuesday. Everybody know about the movie Salt of the Earth? Have you all heard of that? Okay, it was this movie that came out in the 1950s about the Empire Zinc mine strike that occurred in Silver City. It was a horrible, horrible time in US history. And it was a two year long strike and very violent. And for six months, women in Silver City walked that picket. And it was violent. There were women thrown in jail. There were women hit with cars. There were a, a woman who had her baby in jail. I mean, it was, it was a horrible time for these people. And this professor is trying to document the women involved in the Empire Mine Strike. And so far, she's come up with 110 names. A number of these women don't even have obituaries. They never told their stories to their children or their grandchildren. It was something they wanted to set aside and not talk about. And so I was thinking, because of course I was preparing for this talk while she was giving that one, and I'm like, I got stories out the wazoo, you know? I've got all these fabulous, wonderful stories. And it made me realize we cannot take them for granted. So tell your stories, and don't just tell them, but write them down, record them, talk to Dawn. <laughs> And, and save them for posterity. Because someday, there's going to be a social historian like me who's going through the internet looking for Lois Bradbury information and not able to find it unless you share that. So share your stories. And be grateful and thankful that we live in such a wonderful place and that we have been able to have so many words captured about so many wonderful women. Thank you. Questions? Oh, the other mic. All right. Are there any questions? Jerry? Or do we have to wait for the mic? I think we have to wait for the mic. First Corvair in town. First Corvair in town? Lois Bradbury. Ah! <laughs> See, my husband would love that, as you well know. <laughs> any other good stories about Lois? I can tell you a little more about that Corvair. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we got the car guys going. Here we go. <laughs> Skip. In my early years in Los, in my early years in Los Alamos, I was in principal at the high school, our sister principal. Uh, I got a call from uh, Norris uh, asking if uh, our, our shop, our auto shop, might be able to, uh, would like to have a Corvair to work on. Uh, and uh, I said, well, I think that'd be uh, pretty good. I'll, I'll tell you what I'll, uh, what, I'll buy it for $75 and uh, get it down to the high school and see if the young men and women down there would, uh, would like to tear it apart or something. Uh, it, it, it was, uh, the, the rear engine was covered with oil and that was kind of the problem. So I got it down there, and about three days later, the, Mr. Newton, the uh, shop teacher, came up and said, uh, hey, uh, would, would you like to buy, could, could I buy that car for, say, $250? <laughs> and I said, well, yeah, okay. So I had it about a week. He, he put new oil seals, oil rings, you know, on the valve covers, and uh, drove it for several years took off to, uh, to Texas and that kind of thing. That's what happened to that car. <laughs> so there went Mrs. Bradbury's car. <laughs> Other questions? The Shrivers lived in the 
uh, arts and crafts house. I believe that's correct. Yes. Are you going to talk about Mrs. Short? Not tonight. <laughs> no, but I mean, are you researching her? Before? No, I'm not doing any particular research on her. I'm, I'm really focusing on the Oppenheimers right now. So, um, uh, But I would love to hear more stories if there are out there. Well, she was in the Garden Club when I was president. She, she um, um, prepared our plans for our meals. We had herbs and spices. She did one for every month. And then I think she also was on KRSN, or that could have been Dottie Bittner, but there are people in the Garden Club that know about Lois. Lois was one of our members, and also Mr. Schreiber. So anyway. That's great. Yeah, I just, I do believe it is a, a uh a real hole in our collection to not have information on Lois Bradbury, and so I think we need to start working on, on filling that. Well, the two, Jim and, and Ellen, are down in El Castillo. Mm -hmm. We should go interview them. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Other questions? Yeah, I know. Other questions? All right, well, thank you. Oh, no, there's Georgia. I just have another kind of a curious Lois Bradbury story. And um, in reading Dimas Chavez's memoir called uh, On My Own, the, uh, he didn't speak any English when he came here with his family during World War II. So the, his first grade teacher spotted that right away and asked, it, asked him to stay after school each night and and among the tutors that the school teacher got for him to learn English was Lois Bradbury. Oh nice. wonderful. Yes. Wonderful. And this is Teller and <laughs> All right, well thank you all again for being here. It was great to see you and keep studying. Thank you, Thank you.